welcome Kate West, a writer and editor based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Her work's been published in The Revealer, Religion Dispatches, Fourth Genre, and Hawaii Pacific Review, among others. As an advocate and a survivor of the Christian patriarchy movement, she serves on the editorial board for Tears of Eden, a nonprofit providing resources for survivors of spiritual abuse, and we are thrilled to have her here to talk about her new book, Rift. And in conversation will be Kristen DeMay, a New York Times bestselling author and professor of history and gender studies at Kelvin University. She holds a PhD from the University of Notre Dame, and her research focuses on the intersection of gender, religion, and politics. She's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, NBC News, Religion News Services, and Christianity Today, and has been interviewed on NPR, CBS, and the BBC, among other outlets. And her most recent book is Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured Nation, which is one of our uh, local bestsellers here in the Grand Rapids. So welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the conversation. Oh, thank you all for coming out this evening. And it is such a joy to be here with Kate. And Kate, I was thinking, trying to remember when our paths first crossed. And I read a very early version, or maybe not the earliest version, but an earlier version of this manuscript a couple of years ago, I think. It's, it's been a long time, so it's been a work in progress. And it is such a joy to get to celebrate it with you and to see it finally out in the world. So first, I just want to say congratulations. And um, I'm so glad that all of you can be here uh, to, to celebrate with us and to help launch this book into the world. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning. And you cover in the book about how your very early childhood was fairly ordinary as far as childhoods go. And then things changed. Uh, can you share with us a little bit about what changed and what triggered that change? Yeah, so I grew up very conservative Christian home, but it was, I would say, pretty typical for evangelicalism. And then um, when I was around five, my parents pulled me out to, of, of school to be homeschooled. And from that moment on, I felt like every year we became more and more extreme. I wouldn't have used that word then, but we became more involved in something called the Christian patriarchy movement, um, which has this belief that God is the ultimate patriarch, so men um, reflect that, and women are supposed to submit to that. And so that became this framework for everything that we did the older I became. Um, and so I felt my experience of that was that my life became stricter and stricter, and I felt more, more, more limited in my choices. And how, how, it was your dad who primarily led this, this change, really, and then applied it through the family. And what changed for him? You know, I think um, my dad's personality has, he tends to be authoritarian. And so I think he was drawn to this movement because it validated his desire to control and be in charge. And so he became um, more and more vocal about that with because he had all of these teachers telling him that that's what God wanted him to do. And so not only was he authoritarian, but now he had this extra layer of God telling him that this was how it should be. And so growing up in that, you know, you have this sense of this is divine, the divine plan. And so there's a lot of pressure to conform to that. Um, but I think, you know, there were other people in the movement, there were, um, friends at church who introduced us to content like we had something called Patriarch Magazine that would um, it's exactly what okay, it sounds you like. You have to tell us about Patriarch Magazine. <laughs> I, I should have brought it with me because yes. I have a few copies. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's written by men and it tells you how to be a good patriarch of your family and women get one page in the back to be good wives. <laughs> um, but yeah it was like this it was a, a, a magazine, but it would be like spread through the homeschooling community um, by word of mouth. So it felt really like a grassroots kind of movement, this kind of content that we would get. So we would have Patriarch magazine, we would have cassette tapes and eventually CDs and all these voices became so important in my life of how I was going to 
live as a person. And when you talk the like, Christian patriarchy movement, and you talked about your dad like being under the influence of certain uh, teachers or preachers, can you give us a name or two um, so that I think maybe some folks in this room might be able to connect to um, uh, some strands? Yeah, so one of the earliest names that I remember is Doug Wilson, and he's still a pastor in Moscow, Idaho. Um, you might have seen him in the news recently with, uh, what's his name? <laughs> uh, Charlie Kirk. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh, wait, no, no, sorry, wrong one. Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson. <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah. Um, he likes to say that they're not a cult. <laughs> but um, I don't really take what he says to be true most of the time. But he was a big name in this whole patriarchal movement. And um, we had his magazine as well. And he had um, a lot of influence in the, the classical Christian school as, long, as well as homeschooling curriculum. So we had that kind of curriculum in our home. Um, as I got older, Vision Forum started in Texas. And Doug Phillips led that ministry and organization, and we got a lot of material from them as well before they eventually broke up. So, so I'm curious, how many in this room are familiar with Doug Wilson already? <laughs> There's a whole row in the back there. Uh, and um, how about Doug Phillips? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Wow. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, Google. Uh, no, don't. Actually, don't. Uh, okay, so you write in the book about how um, you were basically taught that if you followed these rules, then you would be blessed. Uh, what were some of the rules that you, as a girl, needed to follow? And then what did that blessed life look like? What were you aiming for? So um, my whole goal in life was to be a wife and a mother. So I was told that from a very young age. I don't remember, remember when that first started. Um, so everything in my homeschool education was centered around how to make me into a godly wife. And so I would learn like cooking and cleaning and housekeeping, all those normal things that 10-year-olds do. Um, <laughs> uh, and we had, you know, a lot of books telling mothers to teach their daughters to do this. And this was the, the, the main goal of my education was to become a wife. And so I did have typical subjects like science and math occasionally, um, but they were always framed as this is how you're going to help your husband. So for instance, math that would help me uh, be a good accountant for my husband. Or if I learned first aid, that meant I could take care of my kids better. So everything was aimed for me being a servant. Um, nothing about what I could do or my dreams um, that wasn't even on the table. So you went through this homeschool uh, curriculum, if we can call it that. Um, and then you turn 18 and you graduate from homeschool. What happens next? So um, I became what's known as a stay-at-home daughter. And what that means is you're practicing to be a stay-at-home wife and mother. So in the meantime, you're a stay-at-home daughter. Um, I wasn't allowed to go to college or have a career or even go on dates um, or have any relationships of my own choice. And so my whole time being a stay-at-home daughter was spent looking forward to the future of when I could get married and become a wife. Um, it was really difficult being an adult and not even knowing that I was a legal adult because nobody had told me that when you turn 18 you have legal rights um, because I was homeschooled and I didn't have that information. So I stayed and I didn't think I had any other options. Um, a lot of people ask me, why did you stay so long? And I ask myself that, but I really had no idea how to exist outside of this world. So when did you first start to feel like um, there might be a life outside of this world? Or when did you first start to feel that disconnect between you know, your hopes and dreams and your reality? Yeah, so I mean, I can remember wanting to be a writer when I was a little kid and wanting to study piano as I got older, but I never, I never shared those dreams because um, I knew they weren't 
allowed. You know, there was no way to, for me to express that. Um, if I was going to be a writer, I'd have to write very Christian stories or something that my father would approve of, not nothing that would be like a career. And so I just buried those dreams um, for years. And it wasn't until I went through my first courtship that I realized how much control my father had over my life. And something inside of me started getting really a lot louder. That quiet voice started getting much louder and saying, this is not okay. Um, I want something different. And how long did you still kind of stay in that world and in that space under the authority of your, your father when you had sensed that disconnect? And what was that like for you? Yeah, I didn't leave till I was 25, and my first courtship ended when I was 21, so you know, around four years of me thinking about leaving. And that's a lot of, I mean, I think that's pretty typical when any kind of domestic abuse situation, it takes a lot of time to think through um, what you need to do to leave and to even decide to do that. And so that, I think that's why it took that long. Um, but I remember feeling very depressed. There's times, there's a, like a few months in there that I don't even have memories from because I was so depressed and didn't know what to do because I felt so stuck. And I, my mental health really spiraled out of control towards the end um, because the more I started speaking up to my father about what I wanted, the more he kept calling me things like a rebellious feminist, um, which is a big insult if you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't know. <laughs> I think that might be the worst name he could have called me. Um, and so I was experiencing a lot of verbal abuse, emotional abuse at home, and even to the point where I started having suicidal ideation, which I talk about because this is pretty common, I think, in this world where you feel stuck, you feel desperate, and you have no idea how to get out of it. So once you did, can you decide to leave. Can you tell us a little bit about that process and also what challenges you encountered uh, once you were kind of on the other side? Yeah, so um, thankfully I had a birth certificate and a social security card. So some stay-at-home daughters don't even have that um, and it's even more difficult to, to get on your feet. So I had been able to uh, teach piano lessons because that was a loophole um, I wasn't working for any man, so I was working for myself under the headship of my father. So I was allowed to teach piano lessons, and then thankfully I was allowed to keep the money, which again is not always common in the stay-at-home daughter movement. So I was lucky. Um, I saved up money, and then when I eventually left, um, you know, I had to figure out how to get a job and how to what I even wanted to do with my life. So. I remember go, walking to the library because I didn't have a car, and I would walk to the library and use their computers and their internet and look up how to apply for jobs and how to get into community college. So that's the one thing I learned from homeschool is how to teach myself. <laughs> Can you bring us back to uh, the moment, if there was a moment, when you knew you wanted to write this book? Yeah, when I first left, I was 25, I felt like a teenager trying to get on my feet and figure out how to even hold down a job. Um, I was newly married. It was just like this whirlwind of, of trying to figure out life. And I wanted to pretend like this had never happened to me, like I could just be a, a quote unquote normal person, um, which I didn't know what that would even look like. But I wanted to be a normal person with a normal job and just be able to like make decisions in my life. Um, but what I didn't understand was I had PTSD. So I had all these symptoms of trauma and didn't even know that's what they were. So I would have panic attacks and nightmares and be very con I was very confused what was even happening. So that w went on for years um, before I was able to go to therapy. Um, Concurrently, I was going to college and working my way through college, and I started studying writing. And I wanted to study fiction, but at, at Michigan State, they ask you to pick two genres, so I just picked nonfiction. And I, I have no other story than my story <laughs> in nonfiction. So I started writing about what had happened to me. And it was really interesting to see the reactions of my uh, fellow students and my professors because um, they just had never heard of any of this and to me it was normal 
So I started writing more about it. I started talking about it online um, on social media. And that's when I realized there were a lot more people um, who have experienced maybe not this exact thing, but something similar. I learned the language of spiritual abuse and um, started working on healing myself and also connecting with other people in that survivor community. And so the more I did of that work, the more I realized I wanted to share my story. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting worse, though. We're not doing anything differently. <laughs> That seemed to help momentarily. Uh, so this is just a, a remarkable kind of shift then that you take, not just um, you know leaving your dad's authority and you're getting married, and then and then you just go from from this you know fairly inadequate homeschool experience into college, right? How did you how did you manage? What was that like for you? And what was it like sitting in a classroom for the first time? Yeah, so I went to um, community college down the Lakeshore campus in Holland, <laughs> and um, I could only take a couple classes at a time at the beginning because I had to work, and I remember really not knowing what I was doing, but I knew I had to get certain prerequisites to study anything, and so I had my first English composition class, and I remember going in there and never being in a classroom before. Um, I had been to kindergarten before I was homeschooled, but there wasn't like a real classroom. It was like sitting on the floor and playing with stuffed animals. <laughs> so like there were desks and like, um, I remember our teacher passed out this test where you had to like fill in the circles um, and like they had to scan it. I don't remember it was called Scantron or something. I was so confused, um, but my teacher was so kind and I was able to write a little bit of my story for her and she helped me learn how to write an essay for the first time. I had never written anything for English before. I knew grammar, but I didn't know how to write. Um, and so that was crazy, but in the book I talk about my first workshop experience where I did write like, a really short two-page essay about my life. Um, and my workshop group was all men, and so I didn't know until that day of class that I would have to read it out loud to my workshop group. <laughs> um, and it was really terrifying, because <laughs> um, I was, you know, back then I would shake a lot when I would talk. Um, I had a lot of anxiety. But they were so kind, and they sat there, and they listened, and they provided helpful feedback, and they didn't judge me. And so it was this turning point of there are people who are kind out in this outside world, yeah. and, and they helped me. And they were people that I was told to be afraid of because they weren't in you know, the specific church that I was. So it was a beautiful experience to like, be afraid and just be met with people who accepted me. I wanted to ask you about that because when you're inside these uh, homeschool spaces, and not all homeschool spaces, but this particular kind of Christian patriarchy homeschool space, um, and inside these churches, there's very much a kind of us versus them mentality, and, and you're safe in here, and the rest of the world is really scary. What were some of the biggest surprises for you once you went out into the scary world? Um, it, what was it actually like, and, and how did that not meet your expectations? Or maybe it did. <laughs> um, I was told, you know, like, that the whole world was, well, college was Babylon, first of all. Like, that was like the ultimate evil was going to college. So I did that right away after I left. <laughs> um, and it wasn't that crazy. I mean, community college in Grand Rapids is, <laughs> is, is pretty chill. Um, <laughs> So you were disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember, you know, that's when I first started working at the writing center there, and I got to talk to people from different backgrounds and different religions and different experiences, and I would help them with their essays, but really they're sharing their stories with me, and that was, I was just like, my whole world opened up. Like, oh, there's all these other people who live so differently than I do, or I, I did. Um, and so it was like a quite the opposite of what I was told, you know. Instead of being scary, it was like, oh, I can connect with people and I don't have to be alone for the rest of my life in this isolated community. Um, I can have choices and I can interact with people who aren't like me. So I've had a chance to read a number of um, ex-evangelical memoirs, right? It's kind of a genre now and broadly speaking, you know, I think we could place yours in that. 
And, uh, but yours is the most literary of the genre that I've read. It's really a beautiful book, and it's not just plain memoir. And so I wanted to ask you about um, the structure the book took and the approach that you, that you brought to it. When you decided not just to write kind of pieces of your story, but when you thought, no, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm going to write the memoir, did you know right up front what you were going to call it and what shape it was going to take? Or how did that come about? Um, I always knew I didn't want to write just a story of my life. I wanted to do something more. I wanted to create something, um, what I say, what I call is creating art out of ashes, um, something that, that can be beautiful, not just look how terrible this was. Um, and so that was just for me, you know, that's, that's what I wanted to do. And writing my story in college, I started writing a few essays, and I had a lot of struggles with coming up with a li like a linear narrative. And now I understand that that's traumatic memory, it doesn't always, it's not in your brain in a linear fashion. So if you have PTSD, you remember things in little spots. So like I was writing essays about topics. So I've like this topic about purity culture and this topic about um, courtship. And then the more I wrote, the more I realized I need to put this into a book. It's not going to be just essays, um, and I have to figure out how to tie them together. But I, but I also didn't think that I would be able to get rid of this PCness that I have, because that's just how my memory works. Um, and so around the same time, I was learning about braided essays and studying other essayists and how they do research to combine with their own personal narratives. And that's when I started studying geology, just like as a random thing, I was like curious. Like I've lived all these places like Colorado and it's like, well, how did the Rockies come to be? I'm like learning about evolution for the first time. So it was fascinating to me to just follow my curiosity. And that's why I came up with this metaphor of, of a geological rift. Um, and so that's what I called my creative thesis for college was rift. And I had this geology, um, a lot of geology in that thesis because I felt like it, it had this bigger metaphor for what I was experiencing, even then, of who am I now, you know, after all this has happened. And so the idea of a rift um, is that, you know, two pieces of the continent or the tectonic plates split apart. And this happened here in Michigan and Lake Superior. You can even go see where that, where that happened. But here in Michigan, the rift stopped. And um, we're not sure exactly why that is, but it didn't rift all the way apart, and that's why it filled in with water eventually, and we have the Great Lakes. Um, but I was, I was interested in this before and after, so I feel like the rift is this, this false idea. There is no before and after because I carried my past with me. And if I dig down deep enough, it's still the same stuff as before. I'm still the same person. I'm just changing and evolving. And so that's where I'm playing with geology. I probably could ramble on about that for a long time because I get really nerdy about it. But I <laughs> love that, that part. I <laughs> love that part of the book. Um, do you consider your experience quite niche? Um, do you consider that uh, it resonates more widely and these are not mutually exclusive? Um, or another way to put that is, who do you really hope reads this book, and what do you hope they take away from it? I don't think it's as niche as it might sound. I think some names, like the term Christian patriarchy, or some of these leaders might be unknown to many people, but I think the impacts of patriarchy can be seen all over um, many religions and in our society, and so this is just one way that patriarchy has shown up in a certain sect of Christianity. Um, and there are still people living this lifestyle now that I still know and um, think about quite often. You know, they didn't leave the way I did. And I think so often their stories are pushed aside and ignored as if the fringe, I remember even the church I went to after, um, nobody really wanted to talk about it because they're like, well, that's the people over there, they're crazy. But I was like, well, that was me, you know, and I matter. Well, I didn't think that then, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's what I want people to know is like your story does matter, um, even if it's so-called fringe or unique or 
quote unquote crazy um there are people who still need to know that they have choices in their life they don't have to stay in an oppressive community a cult a church whatever um so yeah and i hope that people who aren't in such an extreme group can look at their own communities and see where are we having hierarchical issues or toxic high control um influences in our community because it can still happen and it's not like you're safe from it forever. Yeah, you know, um, last summer when Shiny Happy People, the documentary on the Duggars came out and the Gothard stories um, started to surface and it was really a, an interesting moment because, I mean, a lot of people knew the Duggars but they seemed very, very fringe. And, and then when that documentary came out, you just saw so many people thousands and thousands of people saying, you know, this, this influenced me too. This, these teachings came into my church and they weren't all in, right? They weren't um, you know, under the direct influence of Gothard or they weren't in that inner circle, but they could recognize their pastor had been influenced by those teachers. Their um, dad had, their family members had, or maybe their relatives that they knew, oh, that explains that. And that these movements are much more widespread than we might realize. And when I read your book, I thought kind of the same thing, that it has the power. It's, it's speaking about something very particular, but I think it will resonate far beyond you know, those who share that, um, that particular experience. Yeah, and just a side note to that, I, I met with someone, or I met someone a, a week or two ago who was going to a Catholic parish in, in Lansing, and the priest there was bringing up Bill Gothard as a source to use. and. It's very um, out of date, but like it still does happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if I can say, um, in as much as I've gotten to know you, you seem like a fairly quiet person, kind of a private person. How are you feeling right now? The book is finally out. Your story <laughs> is out there for the world. Uh, what is this moment like for you? Um, it's it's really crazy. I think. I'm finding that I maybe I'm not quite as timid as I was taught I should be. <laughs> um, um, I find the more I talk with people, the more I enjoy it. And I am a quiet person in general. But being able to share my story and hear back from other people that they resonate with it in any way, it, it just makes me feel so hopeful for what people can be and what we can do together. Um, and it feels empowering because most of my life I had no voice. And so now, for some reason, people are like reading my story and resonating with it. And it feels like, oh, maybe I, it didn't, it matters more than I was told. Uh, so we're going to, in just a few moments, turn over to Q&A um, so you can think about some questions you would like to ask Kate. But before we do that, I'd like to ask Kate to read an excerpt from the book so you can hear uh, for yourself how beautiful this book is. Let me find it. Hold on. Also, make sure you check out Kate. She was on TV. Uh, was it yesterday, today? Uh, Tuesday. I thought, okay. What, yes. I don't know what today is. <laughs> it is Thursday, <laughs> two days ago. <laughs> um, so this is a, a really short two-page part of the book. Um, before this part, I quote several voices in the patriarchy movement, including um, Doug Wilson, uh, Nancy Campbell from Above Rubies. And then I wrote this chapter... Um, my twist on Proverbs 31 because I felt like that passage was always used as a weapon and I think it still is very often and so this is my interpretation of Proverbs 31. A virtuous woman who can find one. Look at her there. She is valuable as money. She has a husband but really her husband has her. She never talks back, bites back, fights back. She gives him all her days. Her hands never stop with the sewing and the cooking and the cleaning. She doesn't need sleep. She can sleep when she's dead. She has knotted arms from kneading bread. She works for little to no pay. Her change she gives on the streets, and anyway, she wouldn't know what to buy for herself. She wears the thrift store dresses and baggy jeans and small business branded t-shirts and knee-length cargo shorts and button-down blouses and soft, loose cardigans and never lets her bra strap show. 
see she can stay awake on another pot of coffee. Worry, worry as winter comes, making sure all the kids have coats that fit. She can recite the scriptures like the ingredients for Ezekiel bread. Morning, noon, and night, she is with the children, saying the catechism, repeating the questions and answers prepared by the ancestors, running it deep in their neural pathways, singing the words if it helps. But time is always getting away, and she doesn't have time to eat. What with the children hungry, and the husband hungry, and the animals hungry, and the garden hungry, and God hungry, always hungry for her every thought and prayer. And her husband sits over there in the gate with the guys, calling to the other women passing by, laughing it up with the boys, getting home late, telling her she's the prettiest, though, in case she was worried. She doesn't have to worry, he says. And her children call her blessed for a short while, but then they run away, or move out, or marry young. And she ages like berries, growing green, ripening, and falling to the ground. And her beauty turns gray, and her fruit disappears. As she has fewer coats to mend and fewer mouths to fill and barely any dirt on the floors. And she is left with all the thoughts and dreams and desires and fantasies and false hopes that she started with and never could say. I told you to look at her, but really you're not supposed to. She is made to quietly serve, sacrifice, submit, stay home. Thank you. Okay, it is your turn to ask Kate any questions you would like, and um, I don't think we have mics for the audience, but if you raise your hand, I will call on you, and then just um, maybe stand up uh, if you're towards the back, certainly, and then speak very loudly. Uh, so questions, uh, start right there. Yeah, so um, I first yeah, heard... repeat the question. Oh, the, the question was uh, um, if I still have contact with my dad or how, his, how he reacted to everything and if I have contact with my mom. Um, about five years ago was when I first started talking online about my story, and that's when um, our relationship also already wasn't good, but that's when he decided that um, he didn't want a relationship with me anymore, and so I haven't spoken to him really since then. Um, and honestly, that's uh, really healing for me because I don't have to worry about um, his voice in my head all the time. And I can speak without fear. Um, but my mother is still very supportive. Um, and she was just here to visit me a few weeks ago. So um, we have a good relationship now, which is nice. Other questions? Okay, right up front. Do you have siblings, and how are they doing? Do I have siblings, and how are they? <laughs> um, I have three siblings. I have two older siblings and one younger sibling. I do write about them a little bit in the book. Um, I didn't want to share their stories too much because we've all been through this whole abusive household, right? And we all have our separate stories, so I didn't want to overshare what happened to them. but. But we have all left, and we all have good relationships with each other and support each other. Um, and only the four of us really know what that was like to grow up as kids in this house. And so, yeah, um, they're all doing well. They're just very private people, unlike me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all right, in the back there, yes. Uh, yes, in the purple. Uh, but as a millennial, there's a lot of social media conversation going on about patriarchy, um, red pill community, incel community. I wanted to know what were some of your thoughts about that in regards to, you know, religion and all this rhetoric that is coming up about what women should do and how if women choose to dissenter men from out of their lives and kind of concentrate on them and their own aspirations or self-development, what that means for men that subscribe to these types of beliefs. Mm -hmm. 
That's a big question. <laughs> the question is about, um, to correct me if I'm wrong, about um, how in, as millennials we have like, the incel movement or um, men who are saying that they want um, a traditional, traditional wife, the trad, the trad wife. wife. Yeah. yeah, and I just wrote a piece about this actually that was published last week about how the trad wife trend is really triggering to me because it's like, oh, this is what I was taught, um, and you're acting like it's all fine. Um, yeah, I think I look back to why my parents were motivated and the people in my church were motivated to be so restrictive, and I see a lot of fear. And I think people were afraid of things they didn't understand. And so for us, it was um, the feminist movement. And so Christian patriarchy is very much like a backlash against feminism, as I see it. And so now I'm, I'm seeing the trad wife movement, the incels. Um, and I think part of it is, is a fear of our new understanding of gender and our changing understanding of gender. And I think people are... You know, it's it's difficult to change or to change your mind about something, and so I think there can be a lot of fear about about changing our minds about the broader society and gender specifically. And so that's why I see the motivator for incels is is a fear of I'm going to lose. You know, men are going to lose their jobs um, if more women work. That was exactly what I was told is why women should stay home because men need the jobs. Um, instead of being expansive in understanding of society, it, we're tightening it and we're making it more controlled. Um, instead of opening our hearts and understanding people who aren't like us, we're just trying to be exclusive to our one right way to live. Um, and so I think that's a big picture answer to your question. But I do still, I do, I do see, still see this happening. Um, in the millennial generation, which is really disturbing to me, um, with the trad wife movement, and you know, I think it's a it's a tumultuous time, and people are trying to hold on to something and traditional, you know, quote unquote traditional wife, which I could go into a whole speech about how that's not really a thing. Um, <laughs> what we mean is like white women who are middle class. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but... Uh, <laughs> could, could I ask you, um, because we do have demographic diversity in yeah. this room in, ter in terms of age brackets, uh, if you could just give a, a, a quick overview of what we're talking about when we're talking the trad wife movement, sure. and then um, point us to, was that at Salon where you published, or where did you publish your piece on trad? Oh. In, in Newsweek. Newsweek, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, tell us a little bit about, about yeah. what that movement is. So if, you, if you're not on um, very much online, uh, you may have not have seen the trad wife movement. It's called hashtag trad wife. And so this is a trend on TikTok and Instagram. And it's usually videos of women wearing dresses and cooking and cleaning. And they usually have their hair perfect and their makeup very nice. And it's almost always a white woman. And they never work. And their husband makes the money of the family. And they talk about how this is my choice. But also, I need to submit to my husband, which, if you, you know, that's a big contradiction. Um, and so that's a, a becoming a more and more popular trend of young women wanting to be traditional girlfriends or traditional wives and not working and not um, having any choices. And so I don't see that as a problem. If someone wants to stay home and not work and they can make that work financially, that's fine. Um, but when, I, when we're seeing of, of women saying, I need to submit, that's giving up their agency if they ever change their minds or they want to do something different. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm concerned about it. Other questions? Uh, yes. You said by the time you left, you were married. Was your husband like, sanctioned by your father? Or was he sympathetic to what was happening to you? Let me repeat the question. <laughs> The question is um, about my marriage and if my father was uh, approving of that. So that's one of the catalysts for me leaving was getting married. Um, and this was my second courtship, the first one my dad ended. And um, uh, the second one, my dad said yes for a week and then he changed his mind. 
And then I was like, I'm not going to let this happen to me again. And so that's when I started using my voice more and saying, Let's, I want something different. And um, we basically had a secret dating relationship, which didn't go over very well. <laughs> and, um, we decided to get married and move to Michigan because we were living in Hawaii at the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, that's like the only choice that we are not really tracking here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I thought Michigan. Well, anyway. um, no, Hawaii is very expensive to live, and um, we couldn't have lived there. And Fair. and uh, my husband and I wanted to go to college, so we had to move off the island, anyways. Um, and so, anyways, we started over in Michigan, which is where my husband is from. And after that first winter, it's starting to grow on me a little bit more. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So, um, I recently left a cult that uh, me and my cousin both were raised in, um, but it took a long time for me to make that decision and like <coughs> ignore all the hate. Yeah. Um, so what was that, I mean for you, how was it, what was that turning point for you, like what was that click that you know, just, I was done? So the question is, um, is it about when you leave a cult or high control group or abusive family, there's a lot of hate and there's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of sacrifice to leave and it's really painful. And the question is um, one that clicked for me when I decided to, that I could do it, you know, because I think it's, it's relatable to domestic violence situations where Statistically, it takes seven times of trying to leave for you successfully leave an abusive home, uh, an abusive relationship. Um, so for me, a lot of my stories about repressing my emotions and my intuition, and not having a sense of self, and um, when my first courtship ended, my father ended it. I was heartbroken because I thought I was going to get married to this person. And my, I remember my father saying, you need to repent of your feelings. You've gone too far. You're emotionally cheating on your future spouse. And I was just, that was, that's that moment when I talk about like my voice started getting louder inside of me, that, that spark of this is wrong, this is a lie. I can't be sorry for who I am and who I love, and that can't be wrong. And I can't imagine that a God of love would be um, would would make me apologize for loving somebody. And so that's when I knew there were untruths happening, um, and that maybe these good intentions weren't really that good. And so that's when I first started really thinking about it. And like I said, it took me four years to actually leave after that. So I can totally relate. I know it's really difficult. Um, and it does definitely get better the longer you've been out um, because you have to go through all that mentally, right? It's like a lot of energy. And then people don't understand um, what it was like. You know, they, they, it's easy to cast aside people who are in these groups, but it's not your fault. And um, yeah, I know that you'll be much better off on this side of things. Other questions? Yes. Um, how did you make the decision to write the book, even knowing that there can be a lot of ret retribution from that? <laughs> yeah, I think, for, you know, when my father stopped talking to me, that was one big, like, oh, that's my worst fear. Like, this happened. Now, like, what else am I afraid of? Um, he was this big, scary person in my life, and all of a sudden, he wasn't there anymore. And so I felt like maybe I can say whatever I want now, um, or just the truth, you know? And yeah, so I mean, I think I made that decision over years of writing and, and work and therapy and figuring out what, how do I want to tell this story? How do I handle my family members? Um, and it, it, it's definitely something that when you write a memoir, it's not, um, it's not an easy process because you're dealing with your own complicity, your own guilt and regrets. 
and you're also trying to protect people, right? Uh, or try not to get sued. <laughs> um, so you have to think about a lot of different factors. Um, I was able to talk with all my siblings about the book and have them read it just to make sure I didn't say anything incorrect, not for permission. I decided that I was going to write it anyways. Um, so that's my process. And um, yeah, I think I, I just was bothered by how many people's stories go unseen and how many people I know in this, this specific movement and other cult-like groups who are just swept under the rug and feel unsafe to talk about it. And so I was like, I feel safe. So I'm going to share my story and hopefully someone else can feel seen. Any, yes, back row. Uh, there's another movement that's quite popular online. Um, it's the Exvangelical Movement, which there are now more books about. Um, and the, the people who are struggling with leaving the evangelical church who consider themselves exvangelicals, one of the big things is trying to find another sort of community because you are so insulated in the faith community that you grew up in or in the family that you grew up in. Um, have you found a new faith community or a new just support community um, that has sort of helped in this healing process? The question is about uh, ex-evangelicals and how that's a, you know, a growing movement and how people are struggling to find community after leaving the evangelical church and whether I've found a community. Um, I mean, that's part of the struggle in the book is is leaving everything you know, and I think a lot of people can relate to that when they leave um, any kind of community. If they have a, a clean break or it's something that takes a long time. Um, for me, I found a community in, in other writers and other people who are doing creative work and people who could just accept me for who I am because they're doing the same kind of the same kind of create, creative work of digging into who we are and trying to explain, trying to understand who we are and explain it to other people um, through our writing. And so the writing community to me has been that home. Um, yeah. Any questions from the back crew? Uh, yes? Um, so you gave a fantastic interview to Jen Hatmaker on her podcast that was um, on last week. And then you mentioned that, and I think you said it here tonight too, that your family didn't start out in the patriarchy movement. Um, and that your mom even had a job and had her own career path before that transition. So I'm just curious about how, like you obviously have a relationship with your mom, your father's not interfering with her agency to have a relationship with you. Do you worry about her staying <laughs> in the Do you worry about her still being in the patriarchy movement herself, knowing that she lived outside of that? And then, yeah. Yeah, and I don't like to overshare too much about her situation. Um, um, the question is about my mother and how she used to have a job and a career path before she met my dad. And even she worked for a while after they were married. Um, you know, before they got further and further into this idea of women need to stay home. Um, and so the question is whether I'm worried about her in the, in the movement and especially since she knows what it's like to not be in it. Um, and yeah, I'm very concerned. Uh, I, all my siblings have talked to my mom about all of this and um, she is where she is. She's supportive of us. She also lives with my father. And so that's about as much detail as I really can give because it's an ongoing situation and I want to protect their privacy. But I do know that um, I've seen her become stronger over the past decade. And um, having her here with me, I had a surgery a couple months ago. She was here the first time ever visiting me. So that's why I was saying, you know, this is the first time she was allowed to come visit me. And um, it was really healing because we had, to, we had a lot of time together and could build that relationship back up a little bit. So I think it's ongoing, and I hope it gets even better. And there was another one back there. Uh, yes. Oh. 
That's a good question. If, if I have a particular doctrine that was hard to let go after deconstructing or during deconstructing, um, I would say the doctrine of hell. <laughs> this might get a little bit too morbid, but I was always obsessed with the idea of eternal punishment since I was a child. Like it's, I talk about this in my book of having religious OCD, like constantly worried about dying as a kid, because what if I wasn't one of the chosen ones? We were very Calvinistic. Um, and so hell was one of those pieces that was hard for me to stop believing in. And I, and I didn't, wasn't trying to stop believing in it. It was just like I was studying and deconstructing and going through everything in the religion I'd been given. Um, and I know other people have different views on this, but for me, it stopped making sense, the idea of eternal punishment. Um, from a loving God and so that's when that belief dropped away but it was hard to let go of because it was something that I have been afraid of for, for decades um, and it, it's a, it was a tool of control for me um, to keep me in my place so that was one of the most liberating things to let go of as well but it was also really difficult any other questions I have, I have a very close um, loved one who is a survivor of, of spiritual abuse, and he um, couldn't go to church anymore. I know you took, I read your book, so you had that too, where church was too triggering. Um, just wondering if you'd be willing to share your, you know, what, you, what you're talking about deconstruction of your faith, and do you believe in God? Was that different? Was that hard for you to kind of... Mm -hmm. Think about who God is now. Yeah. And so the question is about deconstruction and what I think about God now and um, about church and how that was triggering for me. Because when I did leave the movement, I wanted to hold on to my faith and I was holding really tightly. Um, I wanted to separate my family from the bigger religion and separate it out. Now I understand patriarchy is very complicated and intertwined in a lot of churches. Um, and so, I mean, I'm 11 years out, and so I've been changing ever since. And so I went to church for a while and, until it became too, too hard, and they started bringing Doug Wilson books into the church, and I was like, please don't. Um, uh, nobody listened to me, so I left. <laughs> and um, when I left, my mental health got so much better. Like, I felt like I could breathe again, and that's not to say that church is bad or I'm really not anti-religion at all. It's just like for me it was going to an organized religion in a church building was a lot because that was where I learned to be afraid and to cut myself off emotionally. And all those Bible verses were used as weapons. And I know that's not the case for everyone, but it was for me. And so to, to not be there, I was like, oh, I feel like a whole person now. Um, and so for me, it was good. And I think everybody should have the agency to decide for themselves what's, what's good for them. Um, but that's when I started losing more of the other beliefs, like the hell, like I started thinking more about this and studying more. And um, I just came to the realization that maybe organized religion's not for me, specifically. And so I'm not here to have an agenda just to share my story. And so. I feel like I'm more, um, if I have to pick a label, I always say agnostic because I feel like I'm open to changing and to um, learning more. I feel like there's a lot we don't know about the universe and ourselves. And so that's where I'm at. I am today. And I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow. But um, I, I've been using the phrase, I feel secure in my uncertainty. When I felt insecure in this fake certainty. So for me, that's that's the opposite, and it feels really refreshing and healing. I think we have time for one more question. There you go, all yours. I'm curious if you have a new project that you're working on. <laughs> what comes next? What comes next? <laughs> a new project. Um, I've been mulling around uh, this idea for a novel that I started in college as well. So I might go back to fiction for a little bit and explore that instead of delving into my own past, which might be a good, a good break. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, well, th please join me in thanking Kate.